the first time I thought it might be possible that we're not seeing the truth was in 1986. It was from some mathematics we were doing. And when that hit me, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I had to sit down. It was, it, it really, it was scary. The technical question that I and my team asked was, what is the probability that natural selection would shape sensory systems to see true properties of objective reality? And to our surprise, we found that the answer is precisely zero. So in that sense, uh, what we're seeing is what we need to see to stay alive long enough to reproduce. So the evolutionary process, the process that took us from the original life on Earth to the humans that we are today, that process does not maximize for truth and maximizes for fitness, as you say. Fitness beats truth. Right, right now, all of my brilliant colleagues, 99% of them, they're, they're assuming space-time is fundamental. They're assuming that particles are fundamental. Quarks, gluons, leptons, and so forth. Elements, atoms, and so forth are fundamental. And that, therefore, neurons and brains are part of objective reality. And that somehow, when you get matter that's complicated enough, it, it will somehow generate conscious experiences. But they're all doing it within space-time. All of the work that's being done on consciousness and its relationship to the brain is all assumed something that our best theories are telling us is doomed, space-time. We need to look at consciousness qua consciousness. In other words, not as something that arises in space and time, but perhaps as something that creates space and time as a data structure. Consciousness is not something that brains do. Brains are something that consciousness makes up. That's interesting. That's an interesting idea. <laughs> consciousness creates the brain, not the brain creates consciousness. Right. So we would solve the hard problem, not by showing how brains create consciousness, but how networks of conscious agents create what we call the, the symbols that we call brains. The thing we see with our eyes is not some kind of limited window into reality. It is completely detached from reality. Okay, so none of this is real. Our perceptions are there. They're there to guide adaptive behavior, full stop. They're not there to show you the truth. In fact, the way I think about it is they're there to hide the truth because the truth is too complicated. It's just like if you're trying to, you know, use your laptop to write an email. What you're doing is toggling voltages in the computer. But good luck trying to do it that way. That's we, the reason why we have a user interface is because we don't want to know that quote unquote truth, the diodes and resistors and all that, that terrible hardware. If you had to know all that truth, it would, you know, your friends wouldn't hear from you. So what evolution gave us was perceptions that guide adaptive behavior. And part of that process, it turns out, means hiding the truth and giving you um, uh, eye candy. Before I would look at neurons and I was assuming that I was seeing something that was uh, at least partially true. And now I'm realizing it, it could be like looking at the pixels on my desktop uh, or icons on my desktop and good luck you know, going from that to the data structures and then the voltages and the, I mean, good luck. It, it, there's just no way. The, the stuff that I'm saying here, for example, um, is not alien to physicists. The physicists are saying precisely the same thing, that space-time is doomed. We've assumed that space-time is fundamental. We've assumed that for several centuries and it's been very useful. But now physicists are saying space-time is doomed. There's no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the laws of physics. Like when Einstein did the special theory of relativity, he's saying, let me have a couple of postulates. I will assume that the speed of light is universal for all observers and that the laws of physics for you know, uniform motion are, are the same. That's not a reductionist. That, those are saying, grant me these assumptions. I can build this entire concept of space-time out of it. It's not a reductionist thing. You're not going to smaller and smaller scales of space. You're, you're coming up with these deep, deep principles with the theories beyond space-time. Here's one potential. Right now, most of the galaxies that we see, um, we can see them, but we know that we could never get to them no matter how fast we traveled. They're going away from us at the speed of light or beyond, so we can't, we can't ever get to them. So there's all this beautiful real estate that's just smiling and waving at us, and we can never get to it. But that's if we go through space-time. But if we recognize that space-time is just a data structure, it's not fundamental. We're not little things inside space-time, space-time is a little data structure in our perceptions. Mm -hmm. It's just the other way around. Once we understand that, 
and, and we get equations for the stuff that's beyond space-time. Maybe we won't have to go through space-time. Maybe we can go around it. Maybe I can go to Proxima Centauri and not go through space. I can just go right there directly. It's a data structure. We can start to play with it. When applied to daily life, what kind of impact does it have? A lot. And it's, it's sort of scary. Why are we fighting? Why do we hate? It's, we, we fight over possessions. It's, it's like people in a virtual reality simulation, right? And, and there's this Porsche, and we all see the Porsche. Well, that Porsche exists when I look at it. I turn my headset and I look at it. And then if Joe turns his headset in the right way, he, he'll see his Porsche. But it's, it's, not, it's not even the same Porsche that I see. He's creating his own Porsche. So these things are exceedingly ephemeral. And now, just imagine saying that that's my Porsche. Well, you can agree to say that it's your Porsche, but, but really, the Porsche only exists as long as you look, even if the dynamics of consciousness is stationary, so that there is no entropic time. Any projection of it, any view of it, will have the artifact of entropic time. That's a limited resource. So the, the fundamental dynamics may have no limits, limited resources whatsoever. Any projection will have certainly time as a limited resource, and probably a lot of other limited resources. Hence, we could get competition and evolution and nature red and tooth and claw as an artifact of a deeper system in which those aren't fundamental. And, and in fact, I take it as something that this theory must do at some point is to show how networks of conscious agents, even if they're not resource limited, give rise to evolution by natural selection via a projection. Nature red in tooth and claw, people fighting, and animals fighting for resources and the whole bit, come out of a deeper theory in which perhaps it's all cooperation. There's no, no limited resources and so forth. But as a result of projection, you get space and time. And as a result of projection, you get nature red in tooth and claw. 